Good afternoon. Welcome to this panel discussion sponsored by the Federalism and Separation of Powers Practice Group. Our topic today will be, is everyone for federalism now? To discuss this topic, the Federalist Society has assembled a terrific group of legal scholars. I will introduce each panelist in the order that he or she will speak. Each panelist will speak no more than 10 minutes. I will then allow the panelists to respond to each other before I open our discussion to questions from the audience. As moderator, I too may ask one or more questions. Rest assured though that questions should be questions. Our first speaker will be John McGinnis, the George C. Dix Professor in Constitutional Law at Northwestern University Law School. He is a winner of the Paul Bator Award given by the Federalist Society to an outstanding law professor under the age of 40. He didn't win that award yesterday. <laughs> he is an author of two books, Accelerating Democracy, Transforming Government Through Technology, and Originalism and the Good Constitution, which he co-authored with Professor Mike Rappaport. Our second speaker will be Heather Gerken, Dean, and Saul and Lillian Goldman, Professor of Law at Yale Law School. Dean Gerken is a leading expert on constitutional law and election law, a founder of the Nationalist School of Federalism. Dean Gerken's scholarship focuses on federalism, diversity, and dissent. Politico magazine named Dean Gerken to the Politico 50, a list of idea makers in American politics. Our third speaker will be Ilya Soman, professor of law at George Mason University. His scholarship focuses on constitutional law, property law, and the study of popular political participation. Professor Soman is an author of two books, Democracy and Political Ignorance, Why Smaller Government is Smarter, and The Grasping Hand, Kilo versus City of New London and the Limits of Eminent Domain. And he is an author of, a co-author of A Conspiracy Against Obamacare, The Volat Conspiracy and the Healthcare Case. Our fourth speaker will be Abby Gluck, Professor of Law and Faculty Director of the Solomon Center for Health Law and Policy at Yale Law School. She is an expert on Congress and the political process, legislation, federalism, state and local government, civil procedure, and health law. Professor Gluck uh, is the chair of the section on legislation and the law of the political process for the Association of American Law Schools. And our final speaker will be John Eastman, the Henry Salvatore Professor of Law and Community Service and the former Dean of the Chapman University Fowler School of Law. Professor Eastman teaches constitutional law, property, and legal history. He also serves as director of the Claremont Institute Center for constitutional jurisprudence. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor McGinnis uh, as our first speaker. Well, thank you so much, and thanks to the Federal Society. It's always wonderful to talk at one of these panels. Uh, I think the subject of this panel can be understood as a backhanded compliment to our president. At least he's bringing us together in one way because he's caused the liberal resistance to appreciate federalism, a cornerstone of conservative thinking about the Constitution. Actually, well, I think that is one reason for the cross-ideological praise for federalism that's in the air. It's the shallower reason. The deeper reason is that a whole new school of law professors embraced the idea called national federalism, and two of its most distinguished adherents we are lucky enough to have on this panel. Count me a skeptic, however, about the prospect of any enduring alliance. 
To be sure, there may be tactical and opportunistic uses of federalism by those who oppose the administration. It's the nature of politics for politicians uh, for the meaning of the Constitution to change for them depending on who's in power. And there may be some actual areas of rapprochement. It's a conceivable, for ex instance, that some liberals and conservatives uh, may agree on, uh, maybe against state uh, uh, commandeering, uh, federal commandeering of state officials. But in general, there'll be no intellectual convergence because the right and left understand federalism, its content, its origins, its purposes very differently. The right believes that federalism derives from a text of the Constitution that sharply limits the power of the federal government, giving different responsibilities to federal and state officials. The purpose of this distribution is ultimately to protect individual liberty uh, from government. In contrast, progressives who promote federalism support a federalism that promotes activist government and exists essentially at its sufferance. As the new school of national federalism argues, federalism may indeed be useful in helping national dem democracy work and be an instrument of social change. But ultimately for this school, it's not judicially protected much if at all against federal power. Progress may be helped along by movements in the states, but that progress becomes nationalized once sufficient progress occurs. Thus, the states may be useful to advance same-sex marriage, but nothing in national federalism prevents the federal government from forcing that policy on dissenting states at the direction of federal legislatures or federal courts. Massachusetts may experiment with an individual mandate in health care, but the limitations of the Commerce Clause create no obstacle to imposing that policy nationwide. The difference between national federalism and constitutional federalism, in fact, illustrates the essential conflict in the political vision between the left and the right. The right, what is Thomas Sowell, sees as the constrained vision. Man is an unchanging nature that's self-interested, and knowledge of how to improve the human condition is hard to come by. Accordingly, the question for constitutional design is how to harness that nature for the common good while constraining its baleful effects through government coercion. The result is enthusiasm for free markets, decentralization, and permanent limits on centralized government power. In contrast, the left's vision of politics is more unconstrained, more confident in collective action, even to the extent of improving man's nature. Let me detail how federalism is different uh, in the, from the right and the left's view and how it illustrates these basic conflicts. For the right, the federalism is a federalism of different governmental spheres laid down in the Constitution itself. The Constitution enumerates and thereby limits the powers of the federal government, basically to provide national defense, the protection of interstate commerce, and a few other public goods that the state and local governments cannot provide. The states are thus left with very substantial powers, according to the federal Constitution, but they are forced to compete with one another in a market for governance that is intensified by a few federal constitutional guarantees that are the free flow of goods, people, and uh, information across state lines. And the limitation of power protects against the tyranny, and as the limitation of the power of the federal government protects against the tyranny of federal power, so does the competition among states protects against the tyranny of the states. And so the happy paradox of federalism is that two gov sets of governments protect liberty better than one. Moreover, by decentralizing most legislative responsibilities, constitutionalism addresses a fact that we must never forget. Federal legislation is an exercise in central planning by temporary majorities. And these legislatures have enormous knowledge difficulties in figuring out what's in the local interest. And that problem can't be solved by national government simply copying a state plan and putting it into effect. The diversity the Federalist Prize is emphatically not a way station to centralization, but it's the destination in an ever-changing world. Note, too, that constitutional federalism is a particular way of promoting accountability. The sad fact is that voting, uh, as my uh, uh, fellow panelist, Elias Soma, as well uh, illustrated, uh, really is not a very good way or does not give uh, citizens much way to protect against uh, the national, uh, against the power of government. Because people don't have much self-interest in following politics because their individual vote is less likely to make a difference in an election than being hit by a lightning on the way to the polls. Uh, uh, therefore, but uh, 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 states, uh, exiting states is very different because people can benefit 
states uh, benefit simply by exiting a state with bad conditions uh, uh, to, uh, to a state with good ones without the necessity of having anyone agree with that, without the necessity of voting. And that exit, therefore, gives them greater leverage on government. And thus, the substance of federalism may be perhaps the constitutional structure that best illustrates the difference of the constrained and unconstrained vision. And following constitutional federalism also reflects the constrained vision simply because it follows the Constitution as written. Substituting some other kind of federalism, one without uh, protections uh, uh, for the enumerated powers against the enumerate, against federal government going beyond its enumerated powers, is an updating of the Constitution. And constitutional updating is the essence of the unconstrained vision, because it puts trust in a small group of unrepresentative judges to do the updating. Abortion may be a moral problem, but the legal problem of Roe versus Wade is a federalism problem. It's the federal, federal government unconstrained by the Constitution and thus a perpetual engine of national consolidation. Any movement that permits the federal judiciary to create new rights against the states cannot ultimately be a theory that respects constitutional federalism because it is yet another way of making imposition on the power of the states. The new school and the new power of experimentation, the new school of so-called national federalism popularized by modern legal scholars actually confirms the incongruence of the left and the right's vision. First, many of these scholars don't see much, if any, role for judicial enforcement of the textual limitations on the federal government. That failure allows the federal government to forestall competition among the states. And if the paradox of constitutional federalism is that it shows how two governments can protect liberty better than one, uh, I think uh, national federalism, uh, I, I fear, shows that uh, the reality that without these strong constitutional constraints, uh, 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 two governments, of course, can create more activist government. Uh, take, for instance, so the so-called cooperative federalism, which I think is favored by many uh, national uh, federalists. Uh, cooperative federalism is where the federal government either passes a regulatory framework, or provides money or both, and then the states can carry out the federal program. When governments spend money for local needs, it's, I think, pretty obvious how that creates bigger uh, government. Economists have demonstrated that one will get higher levels of spending for local projects than locals want if the money comes from a national kitty. Think of what happens to the incentives when diners get together and agree beforehand to split the check equally for a fancy dinner. And multiply that problem by, say, a few hundred billions of dollars, <laughs> and you will appreciate the consequences of that kind of cooperative federalism. But even when uh, the federal government doesn't give out money uh, and just has a, a cooperative federal program, it's easier to expand the federal program when the state officials get a share of the action. Uh, and so that's the way that I think the cooperative federalism can be uh, not a protection of liberty, but uh, a, uh, a, 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 an energizer of activist government. And such programs also blur accountability prized by constitutional federalism. Who's responsible for the problems of the program? Uh, the feds who create it or the state officials who carry it out. And with less accountability, we get uh, government growth. Thus, by all means, welcome everyone's embrace of federalism, even when it's tactical, and even when different commitments get the, and certainly when different commitments get the sound results. But don't believe that federalism will become a kumbaya moment, a common platform of constitutionalism beyond ideology and theories of constitutional interpretation. Whoever is president, the right and the left have very different theories of constitutional politics and constitutional interpretation. And federalism is, I think, an arena that powerfully capture these deep-seated and enduring conflicts. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. It is absolutely a delight to be here. And I just want to say, by way of thanks, I have been writing about federalism since 2002. The Federalist Society has always invited me to come speak about federalism. The American Constitution Society, which I spoke to at a plenary session in the spring, has not been so attentive to the importance of federalism <laughs> until quite recently. 
Now, I realize it might seem a bit truculent to complain that one's work is getting a lot of attention from everyone at this moment, but it is annoying to have the people with whom I'm aligned in terms of my politics to be so late to this party. I want to say, though, two things, and, and if you will forgive a kumbaya moment, I think this is a moment for a detente between the two camps. And that is because both the right and the left have federalism wrong. So I want to talk to you about today's federalism, not your father's federalism, not your grandfather's federalism, but today's federalism. And I want to talk to you about the way the Constitution should understand the robust role that states play in today's society. That does not involve departing from the Constitution. That is simply what judges have always done when they need to figure out how to apply the grand principles of the Constitution to changing realities. This is no different than figuring out how the First Amendment applies to media that involves the internet or the Fourth Amendment applies to infrared technology or the iPhone. So let me speak for a moment about what I think is a source of agreement between the Nationalist School of Federalism, of which I am a proud member, and more traditional accounts of federalism. The states matter. They play an enormously powerful and important role in American society. It is possible to believe in a national democracy, in national norms, in a national economy, and still think that the states play an important role. That's the key to what I would call the nationalist school of federalism, though I will just say these days, the word nationalist is used in slightly different fashion than I <laughs> intend. So let me just emphasize how a New Deal nationalist might think about federalism. <laughs> the points of disagreement I think that we have with the conventional federalism folks is how to think about what that role is and how to protect that important role. So let me just play, spend a little time talking about it. There have been twice in the 20th century that we have had to rethink what federalism means. The first was during the New Deal period, which largely involved thinking about what the nature of state power and national power was. And the second was the Civil Rights Movement, which thought about the role that federalism played in protecting or undermining individual rights. Those were two moments when we rebooted, when we rethought what federalism meant and was supposed to mean, when we rethought the role that judges should play. We are now at a similar moment. States play a role in our democracy that was not anticipated by either side. A conventional nationalist will tell you that the national government should reign supreme. It should be able to decide whatever it wants to do with clear lines of authority and just, and just set out its policy and it will be done. A conventional federalism person imagines states as separate spheres, something separate and apart from the national government residing in their own empires. Both sides, in other words, imagine power as involving presiding over your own empire. These days, no institution presides over its own empire. The states, to be sure, are influenced in ma many ways by the national government. The national government's regulations have rushed across every state shore. But that does not mean that the states have lost their power because the, the federal government depends on them entirely to be able to carry out many of its mandates. As a result, the, the source of state power is not separation and isolation from the federal government. It is integration and interdependence. The picture that you should have in your mind is not empires, pres emperors presiding over their own separate spheres. You should imagine the states and the federal government governing shoulder to shoulder, sometimes jostling one another, sometimes deliberately giving one another a push. If you look at what the states have been doing in recent years under both the Obama administration and the Trump administration, the power that they exercise comes largely from the federal government's dependence on them. And it is, in my mind, an important force for compromise. When President Obama wanted to implement national health care, he had to turn to the states to do so. He had to bargain with the states to do so. He had to reach compromises with people across the political aisle. And these days, President Trump has a Congress that is entirely on his side. He doesn't have to compromise with Democrats in Washington. But if he wants his policies to be carried out, he will have to compromise with Democrats in states and cities across the country. Again, I think that is a useful thing. States play an important role in politics also because they are part of our system, not separate and apart. 
The reason why same-sex marriage is now the national law of the land is because states across the country pushed the federal government to change its ways. That's the role that states play. They play a role in dissenting. They play a role in teeing up controversy for national governments. They play a role in evolving conversations. And they play a role in resistance. So I know John is not a fan of what people call cooperative federalism, but I'll just point out to you that cooperative federalism also brings with it uncooperative federalism. That's the key to understanding the role that states play. So I think that is a point that, that both sides ought to agree on because it is in fact the reality. The reality these days is that states wield power by virtue of being inside the system rather out, than outside of the system. And then that leads to the second question, and this is where I am very much not talking about your father's federalism or your grandfather's federalism. How should we think about that role? How should we protect the role that states play? If we want to protect the role that states play, we need to keep them at the table. We need to have them inside the system rather than outside the system. That does not mean that judges play no role at all in policing state-federal relations, but the role is different than the one that we've previously contemplated. The role is not trying to keep the spheres separate, which is a fool's errand. Just think for a moment about the Rehnquist and Roberts revolution on federalism. To my mind, it has been a failure on every count. The courts have not been able to craft doctrine that keeps the federal government and state governments apart, and that is for a simple reason. They are trying to hold back the tide. The finest judges in the country have been unable to craft coherent doctrine on these issues. The the, what the court should be doing then is not trying to hold back the tide. They should be thinking about the conditions of bargaining between the states and federal government to make sure that states are able to play a rest robust role, but imagining states as being inside the system. Call it political process for the 21st century. That's how we ought to think about it. Now, when you talk to an audience of lawyers about this conception of state power, it is uncomfortable. It runs against all of our intuitions. We like things to be clean. We like to be able to identify who is in, the, is in authority and how things are going to work out. We like things to be uniform or at least predictable. But our federalism, today's federalism, is unpredictable and is heavily dependent on politics, administrative regulations, interdependence, and things that are often behind, beyond the lawyer's ken. That does not mean, however, that it's not true. Just because we can't identify these lines of authority in a statute in a clear way, just because we can't predict where states are going to be exercised their power and where they weren't, that does not mean that power doesn't exist. It just means that it takes a form that the law does not fully capture. So I would invite my brethren, who have always invited me to come to speak about federalism, as well as the progressives who are late to the party, to think about what today's federalism really looks like, to imagine the role that states play in preserving a healthy, robust, national democracy, and to imagine going forward how we might find room for agreement, room for detente, room to think about preserving this important role without abandoning the commitments of either side. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking the Federalist Society for organizing this panel and everyone for coming. The question before us is whether our, in some ways, very unfortunate political situation creates an opportunity to help make federalism great again. And I honestly don't know the answer for sure, uh, but I think at the very least, it creates an opportunity to try. Ironically, precisely because we are so far apart on so many other things, that provides some incentive to come together in certain ways on the issue of federalism. Uh, some of what we see right now in regards to federalism is perhaps just a result of specific issues like sanctuary cities, marijuana legalization, asset forfeitures and some others uh, where many on the political left are in the position of making federalism arguments that were pioneered by conservative judges and legal scholars uh, and others. We're all familiar, I think, with the phenomenon of fair weather federalism, which happens a lot on both the right and the left. When you're out of power, you're for federalism. When you're in power, federalism, what's that? I never heard of it. Doesn't really interest me. So that happens all the time, I think. Uh, but I think there's also 
opportunities created by systematic developments uh, as well. In particular, at least for the last 50 or 60 years, one of the big reasons why the left has been very skeptical of judicial protection for federalism is the sense that the federal government is the friend of racial and ethnic minorities, while states, at least many of them, tend to be the enemies. Uh, and I think this is no longer the case, at least it's no longer systematically true, and many on the left are beginning to recognize that. Heather Gerken, who spoke earlier, has actually written extensively about this, so I think this part of the political environment is changing. Another part that has changed is that often those who want very broad national power, not surprisingly, expect that their party or political movement will get to control that power. Uh, and if there's one lesson we can learn from recent elections is that neither party is anywhere close to dominating the federal government for a long time to come in the way, for example, that the Democrats dominated it for 30 years or so uh, after the uh, New Deal. Uh, and obviously, when you don't have much hope of imposing your own long-term domination, there is some incentive to buy federalism insurance against the possibility that your opponents will be in power. Uh, and this is particularly true when those opponents are as far apart from you uh, as they currently are. L lots of data on both voter attitudes and elite attitudes suggest that the two major parties are further apart ideologically on many issues uh, than they have been in many years. And obviously, there is more partisan hatred and hostility than there has been in a long time. Surveys show that uh, many more more people would be angry and unhappy if one of their relatives married a member of the opposing party than if they married a, a member of another religion or another race or the like. Uh, those numbers have gone up enormously. Something like 30 or 40 percent of people would be very unhappy if that occurred, and that's just what one of many indicators. Uh, so uh, if your opponent is not only wrong on things, but you think they're dangerous and horrible, uh, that creates some incentive to limit their power uh, when they control uh, the federal government. In addition, the very fact that we are as diverse as we currently are uh, makes it much less likely even than in the past that a single unitary federal policy can satisfy all the different state and local communities that we have uh, when it comes to a wide range of issues, and that creates incentives for both sides, to some degree at least, to allow greater state and local autonomy uh, in these areas. And as John mentioned, in a highly diverse society, voting with your feet uh, is even more valuable perhaps than in a less diverse one. Uh, and I think if you look at the literature by policy analysts, scholars, and others on this, there is increasing recognition that voting with your feet is a valuable thing to have and that we should do more uh, to make it feasible. And limiting federal power in certain ways is a part of that puzzle, obviously, though not the only part. Uh, I only have a brief time to talk about particular areas of doctrine, but let me just briefly mention some where there might be room for greater cross-ideological agreement than has existed in the past. One is commandeering. Uh, I think both left and right have recognized in recent years that they have some good reasons to not want the federal government to simply be able to order states and localities to do things, uh, and also that this idea of commandeering should not be construed extremely narrowly so that the federal government can easily get around it, as, for example, the Trump administration is trying to do in the case of sanctuary cities. Along the same lines, I think there is broader recognition on different parts of the political spectrum uh, that we should have limitations on the power of the federal government to use conditional spending grants to force states and localities to do things uh, that maybe there should be tighter standards to ensure, to ensure that those grants uh, are actually or the conditions are actually related to the purpose of the grant, uh, that they shouldn't be too sweeping, uh, and also that they must be specifically mandated by Congress as opposed to made up by the executive after the fact. And there's other constraints on uh, uh, federal conditional grants that I think might also be uh, considered in my own work. This is not yet a mainstream position, but in my own work I have advocated that we should rethink the idea that uh, spending for the general welfare should be just whatever uh, the government says is the general welfare. Maybe there are some kinds of conditions that are actually not for the general welfare. We don't have to repeal the entire New Deal or anything like that to uh, recognize that. Finally, another area which might be 
an important prospect for the future to consider is something like rethinking the Supreme Court's decision in Gonzalez versus Raich, uh, where they said that Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce allows it to forbid the possession of marijuana uh, that never crossed state lines and that was never sold in any market, even in state. Uh, to believe that this is a correct decision, this is the kind of thing, frankly, that only a lawyer or a law professor can believe. When I describe this to uh, most other kinds of people, they say, well, this can't possibly be right. Uh, and I think it's not right as a matter of text and constitutional history, uh, but it's also not right as a matter of this is not the kind of power that we want to entrust the federal government with. It's essentially the power to ban the possession of virtually anything anywhere within the territory of the United States. Uh, I would maintain that even if you trusted Obama and the Democrats with that power, you probably don't want to trust Trump and the Republicans with it, and vice versa as well, uh, that this is a dangerous power for the federal government to have in an environment where we have a very diverse society, deep ideological and political differences, and it may be desirable to uh, pair this back. Uh, obviously, there are big obstacles to cross-ideological cooperation in these areas. John mentioned some of them. Uh, I think, obviously, both parties have wings that prefer to centralize. The nationalist wing of the Republican Party, nationalist in a different sense than Heather Gerkins, uh, and obviously the Bernie Sanders-like wing of the Democratic Party uh, as well. So there are significant obstacles, but there are significant opportunities as well. Uh, and we should all try harder to explore them precisely because we are so far apart, we should try hard to come together in the area of federalism. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank everybody for inviting me here. It's such a privilege to be on a panel with Judge Pryor and these wonderful colleagues. I, I should say that I spoke here, it's my fourth time, and ACS has never invited me either. So, um, Something is going on here. Um, so is everyone now for federalism? Um, federalism does seem everywhere, and I sense, I share uh, what I sense in John to be a frustration that it's, it's so easy, it seems so easy for people to be jumping on this bandwagon lately. Um, but I actually want to focus on why I think it's been so easy. And I think the reason is that federalism actually has started to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And even in particular, after all these years of talking about it, even the traditional tried and true fathers, grandfathers, federalists, even people among this room and even on this panel, there's still not a lot of agreement about what federalism is actually for and what its goals are. And it's really hard to measure if we have federalism, if it's working and how to protect it, if we don't know what federalism is trying to do. Um, so t federalism tends to be about two, convert two divergences. And I don't think, I, I disagree with John that these are based on some kind of politics or ideology. Even Heather and I disagree, I think, on the goals of federalism. Um, I think they're about whether you think of federalism as a structural protection, you value state policy, you value the idea of these independent structures, federalism is an end and end to itself, or whether you think of federalism as a means to good policy outcomes. And even within those two categories, a lot has been carved out. So even within talking about federalism alone, some people mean the set of legal structures that empower individuals. Others mean a framework that knits together a diverse nation by allowing us to express and implement differences. Still others mean a system of checks and balances that limits national power. Others mean a vehicle for minorities to express themselves. And still others mean a regime that produces the best policy outcomes through experimentation or local variation. All of these people say they're talking about federalism, but they're not talking about the same thing. Um, so before offering some examples of this, I want to just give, make two predecessor comments. The first one is just why it seems that federalism does seem to be everywhere. I don't think it's the case that things have changed so much, but it is the case that legal scholars uh, of all ideologies uh, have started to recognize that federalism is playing out in places we didn't see it playing out before, didn't recognize it be playing out before, and by that I mean within federal statutory regimes. So my own scholarship has worked on this for a long time, namely in trying to mainstream the idea that modern federalism does sometimes come from inside of federal statutes. This isn't new. Congress has been giving state law a role in federal law for a long time. Countless state federal statutes like the Social Security Act have state law terms within them, and Congress has made states the frontline implementers of federal programs for a long time. But what is new is this idea that some of the things we value in federalism can be produced through those national regimes, 
In other words, that federal law is not an alternative to federalism, but is an enabler of federalism. And you know, with all respect to John, as someone who's worked in three different state governments and believes fundamentally in the power of state governments, I don't think the way to protect federalism is to say the federal government's not going to do anything. That's an antiquated view of the way law works and the world works today. If we take the world as we have it today, we want to think about how you empower state government within the regime we have. Uh, and, so, and that's what my work is trying to do. So a few years ago, I did a little experiment where I counted the number of times in which the Supreme Court referenced federalism as something it was doing. This case implicates federalism. It was 26 cases in one term. 20 out of 26 cases were about what I would call statutory federalism, federalism from federal statutes. It was cases in which the court was interpreting what Congress intended. Did Congress mean to go this far? Did Congress mean to restrict state flexibility? Not whether Congress had the power to regulate the states in the first place, right? So that's federalism from federal statutes, and it's, it exists, okay? So I want to take health care because it's a constant in the headlines example and something that I, I work on a lot. Uh, for all the talk of repeal and replace, we have not seen a proposal in the name of federalism that would dismantle the entire federal health care system. Virtually all the proposals are seeking to give states flexibility from within. If you want to make Medicaid a block grant, that's still federalism from federal statutes. It's saying we want to have a federal structure, but you want to give states as much power as possible from within that. And it's also indisputable that states have exercised enormous power from within the Affordable Care Act. Part of that is due to NFIB versus Sebelius. The states exerted enormous amount of leverage over the Obama administration in exerting concessions when it comes to Medicaid waivers, privatization, and now potentially work requirements. That would have been unthinkable if the Obama administration just left the states out entirely and federalized Medicaid. By including states as a forefront of Medicaid implementation, it gave states the power to implement what a lot of people in this room think Medicaid should be about. I don't agree with work requirements. Many of you probably do agree with work requirements. That's because Medicaid is a state-run program. If it was all federal, states would have had that ability. Um, and I'll also say that state law has remained central to health law today in a way it wouldn't have been had the Affordable Care Act just nationalized the entire insurance system. There have been literally hundreds of state statutes and, and uh, regulations that have been promulgated to implement the Affordable Care Act. States have regulated their insurance markets in a way they never would have been able to if Congress had taken over. Um, so what's exciting about this from a legal scholarship perspective is that it gives Federalist scholars some opportunities to develop new doctrines. And I'm not just talking about commandeering or conditional spending, which of course are important doctrines, but some things that are more under the radar. So one of my favorite examples are these kinds of blended entities that are now emerging from Federalist regimes, whether it's the Clean Air Act or whether it's the Affordable Care Act. States are creating agencies, creating regulatory schemes that are inspired by, motivated by the federal framework. But in the end, those entities are state creatures of state law and are governed by a lot of state law. Questions are going to inevitably arise about what kind of law governs those blended entities. Is it state law? Is there federal court jurisdiction? Is there state court jurisdiction over them? And this is an opportunity for federalists to say, even though these entities are created by federal law, they're still state entities. It's an opportunity to assert the statiness of these state regimes inside federal law. Waivers are also indisputably becoming a very important subject, right? And we could all agree that there are highly nationalist ways for the federal government to deal with waivers, administrative waivers, and highly federalist ways for the federal government to do so. Right now, there are really no legal doctrines to police the kind of leeway that federal agencies have to implement waiver programs in a federalist or nationalist way. That's another important legal opportunity. Um, so this brings me back to my first point, which is my final point. What exactly is federalism for? There are two long-standing possible accounts about the major goals of federalism. One is the structural political values account, federalism as an end in and of itself, and the other is this policy account, federalism as a means to good policy. Um, under the structural account, having states as independent sovereigns creates a salutary system of checks and enables government closer to the people. I tend to associate myself with that view. On the policy account, federalism is a means to an end. Federalism leads to better policy outcomes because it encourages experimentation, because it allows for local tailoring. But on top of that, as I've stated, we've already seen a whole bunch of other justifications that are superimposed on that as the goals of federalism. These values don't always point in the same direction. We can get policy experimentation without federalism. And we all know that we can give the states a lot of power and they can come up with some pretty bad policy, right? So it's not the case that one necessarily leads to the other or that both are even at all consistent. So I want to concretize this just by way of conclusion by offering a few examples from a study that I've done that's coming out in the Stanford Law Review on the federalism implementation of the Affordable Care Act with Nicole Huberfeld at BU. 
If you track the Affordable Care Act's Federalist features for five years, in an effort to determine if these state-led features were actually Federalist, did they actually empower the states, um, those features are the Medicaid expansion and the, um, and the insurance exchange implementation. So we examined also traditional federal values, values including cooperation, disobedience, autonomy, variety, experimentation, and good policy outcomes. And it turns out that we were actually unable to answer the questions we set out to answer. The reason is that we could easily say that the Affordable Care Act gave the states more power than they would have had over health care if they had been left out entirely, but we could not actually say that the state-led exchanges produce better policy outcomes in terms of more insurance, uh, companies, lower prices, and we actually couldn't say that there was as much for that state-led, uh, the state-led programs produce as much variety and implementation as the federal ones. It turns out that the federally operated insurance exchanges had as much policy variety within them as the state-led insurance exchanges. We also found some common federalism metrics to be rather meaningless in this, in this instance. And let me give two examples of that. What does it mean to cooperate or disobey in this, in this era of modern federalism? The states that implemented their own insurance exchanges, were they more cooperative than the ones that let the Obama administration up implement the insurance exchanges? Take Oregon. Oregon tried to implement its own insurance exchange. It failed for technical reasons. The federal government came in and operated it. The Oregon exchange and the, te and the Texas exchange were exactly the same in terms of structure. Both are federally operated. Are both equally cooperative, equally uncooperative? Could federalism just be a question of attitude? That seems entirely unsatisfying, right? With the Medicaid expansion, the states that expanded Medicaid, were they the most cooperative? How about the ones that didn't expand Medicaid? How about the ones that went in and got the waivers they wanted, got to privatize Medicaid in their markets? Who was more sovereign? Who was more autonomous? None of this means that federalism doesn't exist, but it means that we don't have the vocabulary to really understand it or appreciate it. I just think healthcare is one example of many, I would suggest, that we could repeat this story across many different fields. Um, and I, I would say that of all the people in this country to think about what federalism really should be for as a means to itself or as a means to an end, this is the organization to actually tackle those issues. Thank you. Thanks very much. I've got to take my first moment to do something I should have done at the start of the panel, which is to put my other hat on, and uh, as the chairman of the Federalism and Separation of Powers Practice Group, to invite all of you that are interested in joining our executive committee to contact me or Dean Reuter uh, and to let us know of your interest. We're always in need for good people that are interested in these issues. Okay, now, now I can start my clock. All right. Um, Going fifth on a panel of such scholars is a little like, like, like being uh, Liz Taylor's seventh husband. It's not, I don't know what the job is, it's just I gotta figure out a way to make it interesting. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try and talk about some of what I see the contradictions in the newfound federalism on the left and try and then contrast that with, uh, with what I see as fairly consistent views on the right on federalism even after the change of the administration. Um, and let me take a couple of really concrete examples. So President Obama's uh, uh, unilateral executive uh, actions on uh, creating the DACA and DAPA programs. Um, uh, in the Texas versus United States challenge to that program, uh, a, a brief filed by the leading Democrat states uh, said the plaintiff states filed this suit not because they are suffering any meaningful harm, but rather to achieve a political goal that they could not achieve through the political process. Now, I thought that language would have been actually much more appropriate to what President Obama did by the executive order after he couldn't achieve the change in DACA or DAPA uh, through the political process. Um, on the contrast side, we've got President uh, Trump's repeal of the DACA program, which actually isn't something that's happened yet, but, but the threat is there. Uh, and the, the author of the Obama-era DACA program, Janet Napolitano, uh, is the leading suit challenging uh, his notion to repeal this illegal DACA order. And in a bit of really grand hitzpah, she says that my DACA order, which did not go through the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, you're violating the Administrative Procedures Act by withdrawing it. And this is the basis of her suit. Um, another, another example, the lawsuit uh, by the United States against Arizona on Arizona's SB 1070 bill. Um, uh, one of the leading briefs in the case, authored by the Supreme Court Clinic at Yale Law School, said that Arizona's mandate would impede federal authorities' compelling enforcement priorities. 
Now, many of the same players in that suit challenging Arizona's authority to try and help implement existing federal law are, are at the forefront of the various actions against President Trump's sanctuary sitting uh, funding uh, cutoffs on the very argument that um, uh, President Trump is here trying to in interfere with local jurisdictions' effort to set their own immigration enforcement strategies. Uh, and Judge Oreck, who was involved uh, at the Department of Justice in the Obama administration in that original suit against Arizona, is now sitting as judge in the Northern District of Illinois, said federal funding that bears no meaningful relationship to immigration enforcement cannot be threatened merely because a jurisdiction chooses an immigration enforcement strategy of which the president disapproves. So you see this, this, this utter conflict in the, in the kind of arguments that are being made. Um, now, you might say, well, Texas started this uh, by suing, uh, uh, challenging the DAPA program itself. Um, but those suits were not so much federalism suits as separation of power suits. Uh, they were challenges to the president for unilaterally doing what the Constitution didn't give him the authority to do. If we're going to take seriously the old process federalism, uh, which is that the role the states have to check the federal government exists in the, p the, the predominant place they have in the federal legislature, particularly in the Senate, then unilateral executive actions, either doing what is not authorized, as was in those cases, um, excuse me, or, uh, uh, doing what is not authorized or failing to do what is required uh, should be challenged by the states as a way to push back at least on executive power when they're uh, acting without any legislative support. Um, we see a lot of that uh, going on, but we, another example of this, uh, the notion of conditions on federal funding. Um, we see uh, cross purposes, and let me, the, 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 the latest case, and I highly commend to your attention uh, Judge Leinenweber's uh, decision in Chicago versus Sessions out of the Northern District of Illinois back in September. Uh, judge Leinenweber is a senior judge, was appointed by Ronald Reagan, uh, and he strikes down uh, the, 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 the Department of Justice conditions that are imposed on the burn grants. That's the headline that you all saw after that decision came down. The burn grant, the sanctuary city restrictions are held to be illegal. Um, but if you read the decision, it's a very carefully crafted one on where the president or the attorney general or the Department of Justice had been delegated the authority to impose conditions uh, in a clear-cut way. And he said for the burn grants, it's in a particular subchapter, a, no, a particular part of a particular subchapter of a chapter uh, that did not have a delegated authority to impose conditions. Um, Necessarily, then, the chapters that he contrasted that language with that did include such authority would deliberately, explicitly allow the Department of Justice to impose all sorts of conditions. Um, folks on the left side are nevertheless challenging the ability of the federal government to impose strings on any federal funding there. And I want to contrast that with the strings that were imposed by the Obama Department's Justice Department, Education Department, on federal education funding in the transgender bathroom uh, guidance memo. All of those strings were perfectly acceptable. And so uh, rather than looking very carefully at what uh, level of discretion was delegated to the executive to impose such conditions on federal funding, and you know, leave aside for a moment which of these federal funding programs is actually constitutionally permissible or not. That would, that would go back not just to our grandfather's federalism, <laughs> but great, great, great fan grandfather's federalism, I suppose. Um, uh, the, the level of inconsistency here is striking. Um, uh, the, the, uh, let me take up a couple of other comments, though, and, and uh, to kind of close this out and then kind of lead into our uh, exchange among ourselves. Um, um, uh, Dean Gherkin talks about uh, a couple of things that I just, I just don't think are factually accurate. The federalism version, today's federalism that she espouses, seems to treat the states not as separate sovereigns uh, with sovereign authority over the powers that remained uh, reserved to them, but, but in a world in which the federal government's power is really unlimited, just kind of administrative units to try and help us figure out how to make this big government operation better. And whatever federalism sovereignty we claim is really a pushback within an accepted preconceived notion of a rather large, uh, indeed unlimited federal government. 
Um, I just don't think that's true as an original matter, and it ought not to be true today if we're going to fight back against the, the burgeoning size of the federal government. Um, and then she gave a couple of particular examples um, that President Obama had to reach across the political aisle in order to achieve Obamacare. I don't seem to remember that being this, the, 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 the case back in 2010. Or, or this one. That, that same-sex marriage occurred at the federal level because states across the country were pushing the feds in that direction. I was involved in 35 different state elections, and, and, and the first 35, there were three at the very end that went the other direction, but all 35 of those that I was involved in went one way, and the, and the, and the numbers were overwhelming. More than 50 million people in, in America voted one way, not the way the Supreme Court voted, uh, and only 30 million voted the other. So I just don't think these are kind of good examples. Now, let me go back to um, uh, the, the Obamacare and the repeal and replace idea. I ran for attorney general in California in 2010, back when the Tea Party movement was really getting rolling. Um, uh, repealing Obamacare was the thing. The, the repeal and replace language seems to have arisen here in Washington, D.C. Uh, you go out in the rest of the country, the people that were engaged in these efforts, oh, we don't want it replaced, we want it repealed. We want it gone. We don't want the federal government telling our states or our local governments or our private hospitals how to run our health care. It's not replace it with some other big federal program that's going to drive this thing. And so that, that whole language has been distorted uh, you know, from folks right or left, Republican or Democrat, all of who live within 100 miles of this place right here. It's not the language that everybody else in the country uh, was talking about. Um, uh, now, let me then close this. I got one minute left. Um, uh, there are two kind of theoretical problems here that I think we need to address. One is the one-way ratchet problem view of today's federalism, that the federal government kind of sets standards for everybody, and the states are allowed to deviate from those standards as long as they ratchet it up more, not to reduce government more. That's a huge problem that kind of intrudes on state sovereignty. And the other, I think, comes from Justice Roberts' failure to really appreciate the full gun at the head from the Medicare expansion. He talked about we're going to repeal all of your prior, prior existing relied upon Medicaid uh, to force you to adopt our Medicaid expansion. The real gun in the, to the head problem with that Medicaid program is I'm surprised there were any states that still haven't signed on to it. If I've got the federal government's tax um, a sucking machine coming in and driving, uh, uh, pulling in all the tax revenues from states like Texas or what have you, and then taking that to Washington and then sending it out to states that agree to cooperate with the federal government, then the states that are not participating in that Medicaid expansion are having their resources drained from them to subsidize other states. Until we address that gun to the head problem, um, which I don't think we're ever going to get if we don't get back to addressing federalism in terms of enumerated powers and the limits on the federal government, then all of the federalism that we're left with in today's federalism is simply going to be treating the states as mere administrative uh, units on an ever-increasingly large federal leviathan. Thanks. Okay. Uh, at this moment, I ask the panelists whether there are any who kind of want to respond to anything else that they've heard from other panelists, particularly those who spoke earlier. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say or before we open it up to other questions? Don't rush all in at one time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so we have at least one mic uh, on the floor. Uh, two, I see two mics. Uh, so. Uh, our first question is going to come from the founder of uh, the Federalist Society, uh, Professor Calabresi, uh, who, if anyone would get any leeway from the moderator about whether he's asking a question or not, <laughs> <laughs> probably be Steve, uh, but I trust him to ask a question. <laughs> Wonderful to uh, be uh, asking a question for a panel chaired by Judge Pryor, who I first met at Tulane Law School when he was the chapter stu student president there, probably 30 years ago or so. And uh, my question 32. is- 32. 32. 
My, my question is uh, directed to Dean Gherkin and John McGinnis. And I should say, Dean Gherkin really has been a pathbreaker on federalism in terms of being willing as a political liberal to write positively about federalism and embrace it. And she's really done a lot to legitimate discussion about federalism and she deserves the gratitude of everyone in the room for doing that. There is a very difficult federalism problem that is causing the country, I think, uh, huge headaches at the moment. And that is uh, the McCarran-Ferguson Act of 1946. And the McCarran-Ferguson Act is a statute that was enacted by Congress that allows the states to regulate health insurance individually and to only allow people within the state to buy health insurance from an insurer within the state who is licensed within the state. And it expressly- Not, not just limited to health insurance, right? All, all insurance, all but insurance. it's particularly, I'm gonna focus particularly on health insurance. Yes, it's all insurance. And in particular, the McCarran-Ferguson Act uh, authorizes the states to regulate insurance without regard to the problems of the Dormant Commerce Clause and without regard to the uh, antitrust laws. And the effect of the McCarran-Ferguson Act in the healthcare area is that all 50 states have their own licensed health providers. In most states, there's only a few licensed health providers, so there's an oligopoly oligopoly market. In some states like Maine, there's only one healthcare provider. And you, uh, states, uh, companies cannot compete across state lines to provide health insurance. So uh, as an employee of uh, Northwestern University, I have to buy my health insurance from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, even if Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas may have a better plan. The effect of the McCarran-Ferguson Act is to eliminate competition among the states, uh, to limit competition, to limit commerce. The purpose of the Commerce Clause was to lift barriers to trade and commerce among the states. The McCarran-Ferguson Act uses the commerce power to create barriers. And by creating uh, a situation where each state has only one or a few health insurers, uh, we have a problem where the quality of health care has gone down and the cost has gone up. And one can see that if one imagines what would happen if Congress licensed the states to uh, exclusively license grocery stores so that you could only buy your groceries from grocery stores that were licensed in Illinois or Connecticut. Um, presumably quality would go, go down and prices would go up. So I was wondering if you have any comments on either the constitutionality of using the Commerce Clause to eliminate competition among the states, as the McCarran-Ferguson Act does, or as a policy matter over on whether the McCarran-Ferguson Act ought to be repealed, at least as to health insurance, and possibly as to insurance altogether, so that insurers can compete across straight lines the same way that grocery stores do. Quick, all right. Okay, well, uh, certainly as a policy matter, I think it's very simple to say that uh, the McCarran-Ferguson Act is a bad act because it interferes with a, a larger market and larger markets are generally really good for people. Uh, so as a constitutional matter, so uh, I've not actually written an article about this, so please don't hold me to every jot and tittle of what I'm going to say, but I've actually long thought, this would be heresy to Justice this is Scalia and Thomas, that the Dormant Commerce Clause exists. I go back to uh, Justice Marshall's concurrence of Gibbons v. Ogden. The way I understand it is that the commerce power is given to the federal government. The other, the other powers, police power, health and safety power, remain in the uh, state government. And so when, uh, if that's the case, it's the federal government's authority over commerce. I don't believe they can delegate that uh, back to the states. That's a division of government, mm -hmm. and there are, so to, there are important responsibilities of the federal government. I sort of alluded to those. To make the structure of competition work well, they need to get rid of the blocks between uh, interstate commerce, and so that's what it should do. And that also serves, although that's the textual argument, to I think a very important point about federalism, that federalism is about the distribution of powers and the protection of liberty, not about state sovereignty. 
state officials might love this. They, they, that gives them ability to regulate, to extract rents from various uh, uh, people, and to create a cartel where they actually they, they don't compete. And so often, I think state, uh, the federal government, by actually in either empowering states or through its regulations, uh, can actually interfere with vigorous competition among uh, uh, in, uh, in, in a market. And I think that's an example of this. And so uh, here you can, uh, I don't know if this makes me a national a federalist, but I think <laughs> Uh, that the Dormant Commerce Clause is, uh, uh, the Commerce Power is uniquely in the uh, federal government. That doesn't mean, of course, that the states don't have a lot of authority to affect commerce, but when their authority is actually commercial in nature, I'm skeptical of it. I think we might go back and think uh, about, uh, rethink and think about making uh, Justice uh, uh, Marshall's uh, dicta in Gibbons v. Ogden the law of the land. I have to ask. Uh, before Dean Gherkin uh, speaks. Does that mean, uh, Professor McGinnis, that you think, as I think Richard Epstein argues in his book, The Classical Liberal Constitution, that the McCarran-Ferguson Act is unconstitutional? Uh, because, it, because it is a use of the commerce power to stifle I, I think competition as, a, obviously as opposed not, to... Obviously not under our precedent, but as an original matter, I, that's the argument that, I am, uh, that I'm at least uh, putting out there, yes. Yeah. Okay. Dean Gerken, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's... it's um, of course, I love getting a question from Stephen Calabresi, because I'll just say for those on the left, they've admired um, uh, Professor Calabresi's consistent approach even when when his com uh, commitments uh, lead him to progressive outcomes. So there's a mutual admiration society here. It's really lovely to have you ask this question. I must confess, I was not expecting a Dormant Commerce Clause question on this panel. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm especially reluctant to uh, answer this um, because anything involving uh, the Dormant Commerce Clause in healthcare, you should not do without a license. And the licensed <laughs> practitioner is my colleague, Abby Gluck, who knows more about this than I do. But I, may, I think I might say something a little bit more general, if that's all right, since I haven't dug into this question myself, which is, it's interesting that, that, that uh, John would say just a moment ago, maybe I'm an nationalist federalism person. I think in many ways, most of the justifications for federalism at the end of the day, at some level of generality, really are about preserving a well-functioning national democracy. And that's, we have disagreements as to how best to do that. We have different pictures of what is a well-functioning democracy that, that get reproduced in these arguments. But, but at the end of the day, I think that those are where the arguments go. And so we, what we should be talking about is, I think, not, as, as Abby Gluck noted, what do those ends look like in today's, in today's society? And so that leads to answers to questions like yours, if we could hash them out. Uh, but, but I do think that we are all engaged in the same endeavor at the end of the day, which leads to moments like this, uh, where, um, where we might have a, a, a very conservative professor thinking he might be a nationalist, and it leads to moments when, <laughs> when progressives actually, and by progressives I don't mean the fair weather federalism people, but the people who have genuinely always believed in federalism might actually acknowledge a role, for example, for the courts to play, which is not a consistent view on the progressive side, but I think is something that within the national school, I think, I think it's true to say that all of us I think the judges have a role in, in, in preserving state federal relations. We just have a different view about how to do it. Yeah. Let, let me just, uh, yeah, of please. Uh, I wonder if I can just respond to that. I, mean, I think in some sense, I think it's important to understand that my commitment to the Dormant Commerce Clause is in some sense to actually make the state's competition more vigorous. So it, I, I'm, a little, uh, I'm a little cautious about seeing it as just national federal. It's about protecting a national power but in the service of, I think, a more general market for governance. Professor Stelman. I'd just like to point out that if my memory does not fail me, John McGinnis actually has written about this. Uh, I know this because <laughs> I was the co-author on that article. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, well, wait a minute. Wait, maybe we have a better understanding now of who really authored it. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so, years, but I believe this particular passage was inserted by John. Do I agree with it? <laughs> I, wouldn't have, I, I wouldn't have let him insert it if that were not the case. And there we do say that, uh, at least tentatively, that uh, we think the Dormant Commerce Clause should be interpreted to create an exclusive federal power 
and thinking about this further, uh, I think the problem here is not so much necessarily that it's unconstitutional to use the commerce power to suppress competition, but that it's unconstitutional to in effect delegate it to a state government. Uh, so uh, one disagreement that I sometimes have with Abby Gluck and with Heather Gerth, and I actually agree with Heather on many things relating to federalism where we differ, is that I think there need to be enforceable limits in w with respect to areas of federal power to keep it more tightly in bounds, but in some cases the same thing is true of the states. Uh, and ultimately, as the title of John's in my article, Federalism versus States' Rights, tries to emphasize uh, the goal of having a judicially enforceable federalism is not to benefit the states or to make state governments happy or whatnot, is to create a system where you have diversity and competition uh, that flourish and in some cases state governments might not actually like that. They might prefer to have a cartel, they might prefer to impose their preferences on other states and so forth, uh, but I don't think the goal here is to make them happy, the goal is to make all the rest of us happy. Um, just the last three comments show that everyone has different views of what federalism is for, but yeah. just on, on, the, um, on Steve's question, so I think the McCarran-Ferguson Act is just, it's a perfect example, it's my very favorite example actually of federalism from federal statutes because it's a case in which the Supreme Court mm -hmm. declares that insurance is interstate commerce and Congress can have it and Congress then decides to give it back to the states as an interpretive presumption. So right. what the McCarran-Ferguson Act says is that unless Congress is explicit, so the Affordable Care Act uh, you know, could surely be amended to make explicit that insurance could be repealed across state, I mean, could be sold across state lines and you wouldn't have uh, to appeal the rest of the act or anything. It's just it's, it's Congress's way of legislating in an area in which it already has authority. But the one thing I would say about your specific example, which is also illustrative and leads me to something that I forgot to mention, which is that, you know, uh, there is a lot of data that shows that, ironically, states are not the best laboratories of experimentation when left alone because states that try to regulate above normal floors can get punished by businesses that find it too expensive to operate in that state and they can leave. Um, so you get races to the bottom or races to the top, whichever your view of where they're racing to. Yeah. And so one thing that McCarran-Ferguson does, arguably, is that it creates a framework that allows individual states to experiment with insurance policy without being punished for that experimentation. And it sort of serves this idea that sometimes this experimentation norm of federalism may need um, federal uh, support. Yeah, let me, uh, so I, I gotta come to the defense of the, uh, the Justice Thomas line on Dormant Commerce Clause, but maybe invite the Federalist Society to invite a whole panel about the subject. <laughs> uh, having clerked for him the year that the case of Camp Sawatana, uh, Newfound versus Harrison, Maine was decided, I had, had to, was forced to do a deep dive into those issues, and I think they got it right. But let me, let me take up the broader question. You think who got it right? I think Thomas got it right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank Boss, you. did you hear me? We'll see you at lunch tomorrow. <laughs> uh, um, but look, uh, let me take up the question on whether the act is unconstitutional. I don't think it's unconstitutional for the grounds that have been suggested that it impedes commerce. I think that's within Congress's power. It may be a foolish exercise of policy, but that's the power given to them. Um, I do think it's unconstitutional as an original matter because buying an insurance contract out of state is not interstate commerce. And I think the old decision that the Supreme Court had on that I'm forgetting the name. I, Paul comes to mind. Maybe I'm mixing that up with Rand Paul. I don't know, but but yeah, but, no, but but I do yeah. think that was right. Paul versus Virginia. Paul versus Paul Virginia. Versus Virginia. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I think that was right. In which case, Magnuson Ferguson is is unconstitutional on those grounds because it's not a regulation of interstate commerce and therefore not within the enumerated powers given to Congress. But it's different than saying it impedes interstate commerce and therefore is a violation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question from the back. Possibly, mo oh. <laughs> possibly, you know, moving policies and and principles in a way that I would desire. Uh, I I do wonder from Stephen's suggestion that I thought the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, was really premised on whether or not the state, uh, the jurisprudence of it was really premised on whether the state was exercising its regular, what the powers that are delegated to it, its, its, its police powers. Okay, and, Brian, and, it's not supposed to be to respond to the last question, <laughs> but to ask the panelists a question. Right, so I'm, I'm asking uh, then, then Professor McGinnis, uh, 
you know, isn't it necessary in, in a sense for us to say, uh, absent that one law, uh, isn't the regulation of insurance by many states, uh, can't that be solved by foot voting? You know, why do we think that's a national problem, uh, uh, whereas, uh, uh, you know, whereas something else might be a state problem? Well, oh, I'm so, so I guess, so let me just make a point here. I do not think the Constitution should be interpreted according to uh, figuring out the distribution of powers according to some functional interpretation. My view as an originalist is we should try to figure out uh, what the distribution of powers was. I do think, as a matter of fact, it's generally conducive to foot voting, so that is the case. But uh, I sort of, I, so that I think this is my answer. I just don't, uh, that's not the way. So my view is that this is a regulation of commerce, and therefore it is given to the federal government, not to the states. Although I just want to make clear the states have all sorts of regulatory police powers. So, so I, I think it's a, di I have a di difference in constitutional method from, from, from you. Professor Lawson. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I, I'll address this formally to Professor Gluck, but I'll really take anything I can get from anyone. Um, and the reason I address it to Professor Gluck is because she indicated correctly, I think, that it's very important to understand what federalism is before we go any further into these analyses. And just standing here waiting at the microphone, <laughs> here are the following conceptions of federalism that leapt into my mind. Uh, federalism as a set of legal rules prescribed by a document. Federalism as a set of legal rules prescribed by legal doctrine. Federalism as a set of legal rules prescribed by the legal doctrine the speaker would like to see. Uh, a set of institutional forms, a particular concrete allocation of decisional authority, a set of political uh, coalitions meshing and I mean, all of these are linguistically permissible and empirically observable uses of the term federalism. Are all of us better off stopping using the word altogether and just saying what we mean? Thank you for that really terrific question. Um, uh, this is what, um, in the study that we did on the, Obamacare, on the Obamacare statute, this is the problem that we encountered because it just depends on how you define federalism. And everyone who read the paper said, no, well, this is about knitting together, you know, a national salve, diver knitting together diverse policy. This is actually about encouraging policy outcomes. And, you know, we could even conclude in the paper whether the Affordable Care Act did further federalism because we could say that states had power for power's sake, but we didn't say that that power led to experimentation or even beneficial ends. So where we go in this paper at the end is actually uh, trying to uh, suggest at least some specificity uh, between two kinds of federalism, what we're calling structural federalism and policy federalism, trying to ask people to ask yourself, do you care more about federalism for its structure, for federalism's sake? Would you rather say that states have the authority to make these decisions regardless of what they are? Think of the worst, you know, the, the policy outcome you despise the most and say, would you rather have states make that policy or do you feel that the policy itself is more important? Because I think that that is um, a really critical divide, uh, at least what we saw at least in the Affordable Care Act. I'd be curious what other people have to say, but it's been, I would say that that has been my, hey, Heather knows, uh, that has been my like biggest frustration with uh, both the traditional federalists, but also the new federalists, the nationalist federalists, because uh, without that specificity, um, it's just impossible to know if we have federalism, or it's possible to also know what legal doctrines you would have to protect it. It's a very different thing to protect the structure versus protect uh, a, a typical process that leads to policy outcomes. I, so, I, I love, I love uh, Professor um, uh, uh, McGinnis's definition of constitutional federalism. It, you can't divorce the notion of federalism derived out of our Constitution from some basic structural things. The federal government is one of limited powers, and if they're doing things that are beyond their limited powers, no matter how much or how little they rely on the states to do it, that ain't federalism or ain't constitutional federalism. You can't, you can't answer the question of what federalism is if you don't answer the question what the enumerated powers doctrine is and the theory about limited government that it's based on. And I think getting back to that core is what at least this society's understanding of federalism has been since the very beginning. Can I, 
I share some of Gary Lawson's frustration about the many different uses of the word federalism uh, that, you know, there are academics try to, when they compile lists of definitions of federalism, we can easily get 30 or 40 different definitions. Uh, but ultimately, I think that's not so bad because federalism, like many other words, gets part of its definition from the context in which it's used. In that respect, it's not much different from liberty or justice or due process uh, or separation of powers or many other concepts that we talk about all the time. So I think there are many different linguistically permissible uses of the word federalism. In my presentation, I was focusing on federalism as a set of limits on the power of the federal government that can be enforced through judicial review. And I was trying to explain how maybe there can be greater cross-ideological agreement on at least some such limits uh, than there has been in the past, but I fully recognize that there are other definitions of the word federalism that are perfectly appropriate to use in, in their proper context. This is something Hayek actually warned about with, the, with terminology. Uh, collective freedoms, uh, justice, liberty mean different things to uh, different kinds of regimes. Um, John, did you have something that you wanted to say? Uh, yes, I, I think it is important to understand federalism as the set of rules set down in the Constitution. Of course, I think that as an originalist, but I think there's something sort of profoundly important about that because the alternative to that is judicial updating of the rules. And who are the ultimate deciders? Well, the federal judiciary. And from our very earliest debates about the Constitution, Brutus warned that the equitable powers in a national court will lead to national consolidation. Uh, and of course, the alternative, of course, we may have changes in society that may require changing the Constitution, and that's the constitutional amendment process. But note uh, that the states are very much involved in the constitutional amendment process. And so I think that underscores that ultimately, federalism has to be a system of rules uh, that are laid down in the original Constitution. So I, uh, with all due respect to the invocations of the original Constitution, you should remember that originalism always runs into a difficult problem, which is history is complicated. So I think about, for example, reading Madison's Hand, which is a wonderful book um, about about the, the framers' original intent. They didn't know what they wanted to think about states. They had all kinds of ideas uh, in their discussion what sh states should be. I think about Alice in the Quas, uh, book on the post-framing generation as they deal with the question of commandeering where, where the sides were basically flipped um, from what we see here. So I just wanna remind you that you, we've had two generations of wonderful, wonderful judges trying to work these things out and they have not succeeded and it's not, they, haven't, they have not failed because they don't believe in originalism. They have not failed because they don't believe in a limited federal government. They failed because they're trying to do something that is impossible. So when I teach the commerce class, I teach it as a, as a romantic tragedy about judging. That is, I actually say to the students, the, the judges are engaged in something that's completely noble which is to do what the Constitution commands them to do, which is to put limits on the federal government's power. That's what the Constitution commands them to do. And they have tried to do it over and over and over and over again and never been able to create stable doctrine that couldn't be work, work, worked around almost instantly. So for every single rule that the Rehnquist and Roberts Court has placed on the federal government, there is a ready workaround. The reason is, again, they are trying to hold back the tide. So it, it's easy up here to say, I'm an originalist, I believe in limited in enumerated powers. I think that, that's an easy thing to say. But when you are a judge trying to do your job, it turns out to be really hard, which is why we have the doctrine that we do today. So I just wanna, just a little modesty about recognizing that judges actually have been trying to do this for generations, and they have always run up against the dilemma of, of figuring out, not it, judicial updating, but figuring out how to take those grand principles and put them into practice. Okay. And so I just, just, just a word, you know, just to give your judges, your judges, right, the, uh, give your judges a little credit. They've been trying to do that work and it, it has not succeeded. And there's a reason for that, which is exactly why we need to think about what should state federal relations look like in a modern economy and a modern democracy. I think Dean Gherkin knows how to be <coughs> invited back 
Uh, <laughs> it's a better society. Anytime. I, 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 anyone right. who spends a bunch of time talking about the dormant commerce clause at a luncheon Don't is my kind it? of people. <laughs> but, but, well, I was thinking of the champion of the difficulty of judging in contrast <laughs> with the ease of being a law professor. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make a quick, a quick follow-up point, which is that um, I, I don't think, I'm not sure that saying that federalism is whatever's in the Constitution, is tethered to the Constitution, actually answers Gary's question, because it doesn't actually tell us what that federalism is. It, it sort of tells us where you find it, but it doesn't tell us what it, it doesn't answer the, it doesn't pick among the six categories that you laid out. And, you know, the canonical site, Federalist 45, Madison says, you know, both nationalism and federalism are only here to serve the public happiness, and if they don't serve the public happiness, they should both be scrapped. And it doesn't tell us what the public happiness is. It doesn't tell us if that's knitting together a nation, if that's producing good policy outcomes, it's guaranteeing variety or whatever. So I, I'm not sure that just, just linking it to the Constitution or an originalist vision actually answers the question that you posed. All right, last one, Ilya, before we take the next just question. Just one small point. I fully agree that in some ways being a judge is really difficult, perhaps even more difficult than being a law professor. Perhaps. But perhaps, <laughs> but maybe definitely. Uh, I, I yield to the uh, to moderator at that point. But here I think Heather has actually underrated the achievements of the judges to some extent, which is that in some areas they have had enforceable limits on federalism that make a difference. Heather herself has written about uh, the striking down of the Medicaid expansion in uh, NFIB versus Sebelius. That made a big difference. Uh, Shelby County versus Holder made a big difference. Uh, yes, in principle, Congress could legislate around both of these decisions, but it's not that easy to do. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think sim something similar could be done in the Commerce Clause if there was sufficient will to do it. Uh, I don't think that's an intrinsically more difficult area than these others, uh, though there is some difficult precedent that needs to be cut back, like Gonzalez versus Raich that I mentioned earlier. Okay, um, Professor Simon, thank you. Um, uh, judge Braid. Um, thank you, Judge Pryor. Um, I'm not speaking as a judge, I'm speaking as a um, former uh, antitrust lawyer. Um, the McCarran-Ferguson Act was passed to exempt insurance companies from um, the Sherman Act so that they could fix prices and impose monopoly rents on the public. That's been tolerated for over 100 years. Um, I have a suggestion for the panel and for Professor um, Calabrese. I think that you could be extraordinarily influential if you wrote a letter jointly to the head of the um, antitrust division and the new head of the Federal Trade Commission. Both of those offices have um, bureaus or groups of economists who can put together the economic data that will support repeal of the act. There are old studies I know that were there in the 70s and early 80s when I it was at both agencies. They, that's, they, I, they're still someplace in a box, I'm sure, but they can pull those out and look at other think tank work policy groups that may have been keeping this data and produce a very powerful cost-benefit analysis that I think would support repeal of the act and would be well received by both um, Republicans and Democrats okay. on the Judiciary Committee. And so that's a pragmatic suggestion from a former life. Thank you. And then if she says, what do you think about that? We've got a question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I was waiting for the question, but at least it was short. <laughs> question from the back. Can we, can that mic, um, can you turn that mic back on? The battery is bad. Okay, is that working? Okay. I have a question about uh, Professor McGinnis's uh, sanguine view about the prospect of a new dawn of federalism. If I understand it, it's that there is some sort of uh, durable ideological conflict between the right and the left on federalism, but at least in my relatively short lifetime, I've never known either the Republican Party or the Democrat Party to be particularly ideologically consistent or even coherent. So my question is, what effect will what seems to me on the ground uh, to be a, uh, a massive shift in, in individual opinions about whether or not people in their own states 
should be taking care of and regulating and spending their money uh, in those states or whether it should be Washington bureaucrats or committees composed of members from across the union uh, will have on at least the Article I resolution of federalism question and whether or not we're going to see legislation moving money, power, and influence back simply because okay. the idea of having those decisions made in Washington is ever less popular or even rational. Okay. Well, I certainly don't expect there to be consistent views of federalism of politicians in Washington. That would certainly be sanguine, and I'm not <laughs> at all suggesting that. We have to distinguish between sort of higher politics and lower politics. And look at the great uh, um, uh, prog uh, uh, shifts of history in the United States. I think there have been two contending ideas. Uh, sometimes actually in the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party about progressivism versus smaller and more limited government. Those are the ideals I've been talking about in my talk that I think have changed the way uh, federalism or the, the, the provisions of the Constitution that relate to federalism have been interpreted. I don't think one can look at American history and not suggest that there's been a cross-party movement to more enthusiasm for uh, centralized planning in the 1930s uh, than there was in the 1890s. And that's what I'm talking about. And what I think we need to have is to go back to the commitments in the Constitution. The one thing I think would, would actually, and this goes to Ilya's very good point, I think there would be, people would feel that they might respect federalism because they don't do it now, because otherwise they realize that if they are out of power, the other side will just not respect it either if those commitments were in the Constitution, because then they would have greater confidence that there's a reason to do it. So I think Delia makes a good point on that. But I want to make just a, 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 the larger point. This is, a, this is very different from the ordinary politics, the, the debate between a progressivism and what I would call uh, the, idea that, 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 of, of, of the idea of classical liberalism. It's not captured by our, simply our partisan debate. OK. We are near the end of this panel. Uh, we'll have the last question. Um, from Professor Barnett. Yeah, I, I, Heather and I co-authored a piece on federalism for the American Constitution Society, but I just want to disagree with her characterization of what the Rehnquist and Roberts courts even attempted. Uh, they never attempted to restore an enumerated powers federalism, one that lets the states have the powers left over after the federal government's enumerated powers are properly defined and enforced. At best, they attempted a this far and no farther without a limiting principles federalism in Lopez, Morrison, and NFIB. Uh, I dare to be commended for that. It's better than nothing. But it just cannot be claimed, I think, accurately that they failed to, uh, after using their best efforts, uh, to uh, restore an enumerated powers federalism. I don't think they tried. I don't think they wanted to try. I don't think, it wasn't that they didn't have the votes. I don't think they even had the will to do so. So I'll just, I'll just say in response to uh, Randy, I, I also d use this when I teach the, the, the case law from the you know, end of the 1900s to the early 20th century. And, and I, I let the students do what every law student does, which is make fun of how silly the distinctions are that, that the judges are drawing between a stockyard and when, when, when a good comes to a stop and when it doesn't. And after the students make fun of it and do the usual thing, I remind them that they are carrying out a judicial function, that they're doing what judges are supposed to do, they're just struggling because it's hard. And so the, my only point is, is to say that it's, it's easy for law professors and law deans uh, and everyone else who's not a judge to say that it's an easy thing to do to put a limit on federal power under current economic and democratic conditions. And so I, I quite respect the judges' efforts to do so, um, but I also think they've been a failure. And, and that, to me, is, is what we need to wrestle with in our constitutional tradition. Okay, uh, please join me in thanking uh, the panel for a trip. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.